الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My brothers and sisters in Islam, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Tonight we continue with the stories of the prophets and we derive the lessons that we can learn from them as Allah سبحانه وتعالى brought them to us in the Quran. For a very valuable reason. And if it wasn't that the stories of the prophets were so valuable to us, had many lessons for us, will assist us in knowing how to live our lives as Muslims, if they weren't beneficial for us in this world and the hereafter, Allah would have not spoken about so many prophets and their stories and their people in the Quran. And for anyone who looks into the Quran, you will find that a very large portion of it, almost 70% of the Qur'an is attributed to the prophets and the stories of their people. And the lessons are derived from it based on that. And today, insha'Allah, we are going to speak of two prophets who came immediately after one another, after the time of Nuh alayhi salam. And these prophets they spoke the Arabic language. Their names were Hud and Salih. Hud and Salih. The tribes that they came to who were also their people, for Hud, their names were Ad. And for Salih, their names were Thamud. They were related. They were related and they were both Arabic speaking tribes. They're situated somewhere, they were situated somewhere near the Jordanian area. In fact, Thamud has, still has till today artifacts that are inside of Jordan, in that region. So we begin with Hud alayhi salam. Hud alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned him in various verses in the Quran. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Hud alayhi salam was the brethren of Ad. Allah says, وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ هُودًا And to Ad, the people of Ad, we sent them their brother, Hud. The reason why Allah says brother here is because Hud alayhi salam came from their tribe. And therefore Allah is attributing the word to them by saying brother, called him their brother. Meaning he's so close to them, so related to them, that they cannot say that their prophet Hud was a stranger to them. They cannot say we don't know this man well. Every prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent, he let their people know who they are. And they grew up with them. So they learned his honesty integrity, sincerity, truthfulness, character, and so on. So when he started to give them the message, any prophet, the people had no excuse, had no proper reason to not believe in this messenger or to deny him. So Allah is fair. And Ad, Hud was the brother of Ad, so close to them, and he grew up among them. Just like Nuh alayhi salam, Hud alayhi salam also taught the people about worshipping one God. Ad, they went back to the worship of idols and they started worshipping statues. You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about these types of people who constantly go back to erring, creating other gods, spreading injustice on earth changing the teachings of their prophets and their messengers. And Allah uses in one of the verses in the Quran, one of the surahs in the Quran, Surah al dhariyat a word, a rhetorical question. 
a rhetorical question, a question that is so deep in meaning, yet at the same time, it's a, a question of almost sarcasm to the people. As though, do they not understand? Allah says, bih. These teachings they teach, what is it to them? Is it like every time some of them die, they, their children just inherit their belief of them? bih. They just inherit it? Is religion an inheritance that is left behind by their forefathers that they should take it like property or, or, or like property or some kind of wealth a person a father has left behind or a mother? Religion is not something of inheritance. Therefore, it does not belong to a particular people. The Jews in general, they have this idea which they fabricated was not originally in the Torah was not originally in the teaching of Musa alayhi salam they fabricated a false teaching of racism pure racism pure racial discrimination when they brought in belief into it and they said no one can become a Jew unless you are born in from a Jewish family they differ a little bit on the type of parents you have there are sects among them they differ but they agree that Judaism is something that you are born with from a bloodline and that's why you will find today millions of Jews some of them believe that sorry some of them they call themselves Jew, but they don't believe in anything of Judaism. Nothing. In fact, some of them are atheists. They don't believe in God at all. And don't be surprised if you see in demonstrations in the city, or you hear about them on the news, and among these demonstrations, even against the Israeli government, among them people who say they're Jews. A large number of them, you may find them with people called socialists. They don't believe in God. And they're against the Israeli government, but they will call themselves Jews. Because this idea that you are born from parents of a particular belief makes you of that belief is false. It's untrue. It's unheard of. And the prophets never taught this. The Torah and the Injil and the Quran and the Zams, the Zabur, all these four revelations never mention that religion is to be inherited. Because they all mention prophets of different races, nationalities, different nationalities, different people. So the Torah does not only mention prophets coming to the children of Israel, it mentions other prophets. And Injil mentions other prophets, and the Quran mentions other prophets. No prophet came to say, you are to follow the exact religion of your forefathers. Allah says in the Quran, when the people of Quraysh used to come to the Prophet Wasallam and say to him, we will not follow what you have. بَلْ نَتَّبِعُ مَا وَجَدْنَا عَلَيْهِ آبَاءَنَا وَإِنَّا عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ مُقْتَدُونَ This is their common motto. We will rather follow what we found our forefathers with. And we insist on following their footsteps, their trails, what they left behind. Allah replies back to them. In other verses, a common saying, a common reply from Allah is this. Behold, their forefathers, they understood nothing and they weren't guided. Meaning those who worship idols, Allah is saying they understood nothing of what their prophets taught. They were erred themselves, and now you are erred as well, and your children will be erred as well, and so on. So Islam does not teach this blind following. And there is no such thing 
is because you are born from a particular, particular belief, you are of that belief. Religion cannot be forced down someone's throat. And those who say that Islam forces people, people, uh, forces people into Islam, this is what they try to spread about Islam and Muslims. There is no compulsion in religion, brothers and sisters, as Allah says in the Quran. لا إكراه في الدين In fact, the word إكراه doesn't just mean no compulsion. It means even deeper than that. No coercion. Like you can't even pressure someone into entering into Islam by words or manipulation or blackmailing. Not just by, the for by physical force, but even by blackmailing, manipulating. Islam is clear. Allah says, completing the verse, قَدْ تَبَيَّنَ الرُّشْدُ مِنَ الْغَيِّ The right from the wrong, the truth from the false is clear. Clear. So the people of Ad coming back to them now. They followed their forefathers' footsteps. And I'd like to make a very important statement which the scholars agree upon. Brothers and sisters in Islam, it is always easier to unite on falsehood, on fabricated things, than to unite on something which is the truth. Why? Because people have desires. They have racial desires. Arrogance, jealousy, selfishness, love of money, love of fame, and so on and so forth. Because of these which Allah is testing us with, it is difficult for people to unite on truth. But this is the test. The people of truth are the winners. The people of falsehood are the losers. Because they are following this themselves, their own desires. Therefore, Iblis, when he rejected to bow down to, to Adam, it was because of this same reason. He will not unite on that truth from God because of his arrogance and proudiness. Ad were not only followers of the footsteps of their forefathers, they were also extremely advanced in technology. They were advanced in technology that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bears witness in the Quran about how advanced in technology they were. In other words, Allah describes to us that they had power. The type of power they had was a different one to muscles and weapons. It was the power of invention. The power of innovation and creativity in the world. The power of knowledge of how the world works. What they used to do was the following. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al-Fajr, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَلَمْ تَرَ كَيْفَ فَعَلَ رَبُّكَ بِعَادِ إِرَمَ ذَاتِ الْعِمَادِ الَّتِي لَمْ يُخْلَقْ مِثْلُهَا فِي الْبِلَادِ Have you not seen how your Lord dealt with the people of Ad? Of the city of Iram. Iram was their city. It's the name of it. With lofty pillars, high towers, the like of which was never created in any land. No one had beaten them to this advanced technology. When you talk about pillars high in the sky, we're talking about them building these pillars in the most awkward situate places, valleys, hills, mountains, rock, solid and smooth, soft and along, beach, along water, anywhere. High pillars that carried high towers in the sky. They were the first in this type of engineering. And because of that, why does Allah mention it? Because of that, they had this sense of arrogance. That because of this invention that they have in their advanced technology, they ruled the world. They thought, this is what they had in there, that they are the rulers, they are superior to everyone else. In today's world, we have a similar system of ideologies. That, we, that they try to manipulate our minds and our children's minds on television. That the superpowers of the world, the countries of superpower, what, why are they superpowers? What makes them a superpower? When you look deeply into it, what is it? It's money and weaponry and 
technology. Money, weaponry, and technology makes you a superpower. For, to me, this makes you, what I understand this to be, it has nothing to do with morality. It has nothing to do with intelligence, really. It has nothing to do with knowing your purpose in life. All we have seen from this is atrocities, terror, killing, bombing, manipulating, splitting people into two classes, the upper and the lower. And it is a support of what we call today capitalism. Capitalism. The strong consumes the weak. The weak has no, has no options in this world, has no opportunity. Now, I'm not talking about the, our state in Australia. You won't understand it here. We're talking about the majority of the poor countries in the world that are consumed by these so-called superpowers. I'm not going to go into the atrocities of those so-called superpowers, of what they have done over the hundreds of years, and especially since World War I till today. Brothers and sisters, Ad was like that. And because of this feeling of superiority, because they built high lofty pillars, these people had no intelligence. They had no moral well-being. Compare that to the prophets and the, and the messengers of Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was offered everything. The Meccan leaders came to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and offered him everything. They said to him, if you want women, we'll give you women. If you want to be our king, we'll give you a king. If it's wealth that you want, make you the richest. Just leave what you're calling to. And he said to his uncle, say to them, say to them, if they were to place the moon in my right and, and the sun in my left, or vice versa, I will never leave this call. Superiority is not in what you have of this world. Superiority is not that you can make better mathematical, mathematical calculations than others. Superiority is not that you can create or invent nuclear warfares that can wipe out countries and people. That is not superiority. That you can be richer than others and wear more expensive suits or have more expensive watches or drive more expensive cars or live in lofty houses. This is not superiority at all by any degree. And anyone who believes that, wallahi, is stricken with so much lack of intelligence, they are the most stupid people on the face of the earth. Stupidity in all of its meaning. Selfishness, greed, that's all it does. So Allah did not mention the people of Ad in this way unless there was a great lesson to be learned and we live in it till today. Tens of thousands of years later, this still exists. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions about the people of Ad in that they raised Hud among them. And they knew him of being wise. When he came to them with the prophethood later on in his years, the first thing they did was they rejected him and they rejected his warnings. Why did they reject him and reject his warnings? Number one, they were stricken with this uh, disease of superiority. If they had followed him, it meant for them that they are now going to be equal to everyone else. To me, this story of Ad, even though the name is not said, the, the description of what kind of ideology they followed is not mentioned because it didn't exist that time. But today it exists. It's the word capitalism. They were capitalists. And these people, they had this idea of superiority and inferiority. Islam or the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, submission to God, which, which Hud alayhi salam came to them with, meant that they have to now be equal to anyone else. And that your only superiority is in your following of God's laws and your moral well-being, your justice, your equality, not your, not your uh, discrimination. They couldn't accept that. So they used their forefathers as an excuse. This is our forefathers. This is who we are. And this is exactly in World War I what Europe did to the Muslim world. We left Allah. So the Europe came in and divided us into a different type of identity altogether. Brothers and sisters, it's very important for us to always remember, not forget, because till today, this is the case. This is the plan. This was the plot. 
It has never stopped. They're still going with their, long, their plan of a hundred. They, they planned for this hundred, a hundred, more than a hundred years before that. To break the Khilafah. The last Khilafah, the last leadership of Islam was the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, Empire is, not is not something, something Turkish. Turkish. The, Ottoman the Ottoman Empire, Empire was, something was something Islamic. Islamic. Islam, Islam is, different is different to nationalism. To nationalism. And then they separated us, brothers and sisters. And they caused us to fight and to blame one another. Yes, there were members among the Muslims who, who were betrayers. But we don't consider them as part of Islamic identity. Because the Europe came in and they made them think of their nationalistic identity. They said to the Arabs, how could you let the Turks overrule you? You are the Arabs. The Quran came down in Arabic. Where is your pride? And so the ones weak in Iman, far away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, began to oppose them. And then they have different promises to different leaders of the Muslims, and so on and so on. We're already divided. When they came in, they made sure that we stayed divided, brothers and sisters. World War I, you don't teach you about it in school that well. World War I was about the destruction of the Islamic world, whether you like it or not. It was the destruction of the Ottoman Empire. And this empire was destroyed by them with a plan and a plot. They divided us into little countries, little nations. Every sheep on its own. Every sheep on its own. This is exactly opposite to the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ where he said, stick together, don't disunite, for the sheep that is away from the flock is most prone to be attacked by the wolf and consumed. This is what happened to us. And then they made us be proud of our flags. They made us be proud of our flags and we gave our flags a particular feature and we named ourselves names and we stuck together in race, not in Islam, in nationality. So you see it over the years. When one country is hit, the neighboring Muslim country doesn't care because it's not in the name of Islam. The neighboring Muslim country doesn't care at all. But when their own country is hit, or people representing that country are hit, carrying the citizenship of that country, then the country stands. Again, for the wrong reason too. Because of nationalism. We need to break that. We need to break that in our homes. We need to teach our children. We need to break that among each other as a Muslim community wherever we are. Whether we are in Australia, whether we are in Egypt, in Lebanon, in Palestine, in America, wherever you may be, we must break this nationalistic idea in our heads and not see different colors. So Ad did not want this. And they rejected Hud alayhi salam, who showed them signs, showed them miracles, but they refused. After many years of warning them, they said, finally, they said to him, finally, O Hud, we will follow you, but there's one condition upon you. You do not equate us with the inferior ones, the farmers, the, the peasants, the, uh, those types of people. They're backward people. They're primitive people. You cannot equate us with them. Hud salam obviously rejected this. Just like Nuh salam rejected it. Same motto. So in the end, they said to him, if you don't leave us, we are going to hurt you. We're going to torture you. We're going to destroy you. So then Hud asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give him victory. He said, oh my Lord, they have rejected me. They have refused me for decades of years. Finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down the verse in the Quran that he is going to torture them with raging winds of some sort, tornadoes and raging winds. So he said that to them. He warned them. He told them. But they said, you are a liar. Bring this punishment towards us if you are truthful. Where is this? Look at us. They had their pride in their buildings and in their fortresses. Their buildings and their fortresses. So, they used to say, If you are truthful, bring to us what you're warning us about. 
Come on. So Allah says in the Quran, كَذَّبَتْ عَادٌ فَكَيْفَ كَانَ عَذَابِي وَنُذُرٌ إِنَّا أَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ رِيحًا صَرْصَرًا فِي يَوْمِ نَحْسٍ مُسْتَمِرٍ تَنْزِعُ النَّاسَ كَأَنَّهُمْ أَعْجَازُ نَخْلٍ منقعر فكيف كان عذابي ونذر ولقد يسرنا القرآن للذكر فهل من مدكر عاد rejected warnings then see how was my punishment and my warnings we sent upon them a raging wind on an ill-fated day of constant calamity plucking up people as if they were uprooted trunks of palm trees. See how was my punishment and how true my warnings were. And we have indeed made this Qur'an easy to understand. Then is there any who will receive admonition? The way it is described in the Qur'an is horrendous. Like the way they were, the, the punishment came to them. Allah says they were plucked out of the ground as if they were, what? uprooted trunks of palm trees. The winds came. And in another ayah in the Quran, the people of Ad looked above them one day. And Hud alayhi salam had left. He had left with the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah had told him, I am now going to punish these people, leave you and your family and those who have believed with you. So they left and they deserted the land. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to them clouds. What happened to Ad was, they were in need of water. They needed water and they saw clouds coming to them. And they said, oh look, here come the clouds, a blessing. We are going to receive water now. And then they're going to pass away. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no, no, no. This was a punishment. These were clouds carrying punishment who were coming to punish you with. And so the winds began, brothers and sisters. The tornadoes, Allahu Akbar. Nothing can prevent that. Even today, of all the weapons of the world, nothing can prevent a... One minute and a half tornado, which will wipe out cities in an instant. Like that. Allah says, the winds actually lifted the people off the ground. It made them fly in the air. So it sucked the people off the ground, from within their homes, from the ground, from wherever they were hiding. Like a vacuum. Allah is able to do that. Do that. Climate can do all of this. Suck the people of the ground. It can suck oceans, brothers and sisters. It can cause tsunamis. Suck the people out, as Allah says, as if they were uprooted the palm trees to the ground, lifted them up in the air, tossed them around, and they fell on their faces. So they were crushed, lifted up and crushed. Like falling off a 20-story building. All of the city of Ad was destroyed. Its people and its towns and cities. You actually cannot find any more pillars of the people of Ad left. And some research says, of some of the scholars of today and even non-Muslim scholars, they say that this land became no more. Like you can't even find an existence of it. You, people don't know where the Ad people exactly were. There's no ruins left, no buildings of them left at all. Just sand and desert. Sand dunes and desert. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, can you find any more remnants of them? In another verse, you cannot find any more remnants of them at all. Completely wiped out. Because of their arrogance, their rejection, their injustice and their oppression. This was Ad, the people of Hud. When Hud salam returned, he saw the people in the way that they were before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wiped them away. Allah says, And when our command came, we rescued Hud and those who believed with him 
through our mercy and saved them from a severe chastisement. And such were the people of Ad. They denied the revelation of their Lord and disobeyed his messenger and followed the biding or the bidding of every insolent tyrant. They were pursued by a curse in this life and upon the day of resurrection, behold, Ad disbelieved, behold, Ad disbelieved in their Lord. So away with Ad, the people of Hud. <clears throat> Allah says, then when they saw it as a dense cloud coming towards their valleys, they said, this is a cloud that shall give us rain. No, this is, the, this is that you were asking to be hastened, a wind wherein is a painful torment. Surah 46, verse 24. When Hud salam returned and saw them this way, he said the following words, وَنَصَحْتُ لَكُمْ وَلَكِنْ لَا تُحِبُّونَ النَّاصِحِينَ I advised you also, but you, O oh people, do not like the ones who advise you. Rasul Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be afraid whenever wind blew. Whenever he saw clouds gathering or wind blowing in Medina or in Mecca, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to be afraid. Until it rained, then he would calm down. Aisha radiallahu anha narrates. She says, whenever wind blew, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O oh Allah, I ask you its good and goodness which it carried and the goodness with which it is sent, and I seek refuge in you from its evil, and the evil which it carried, and the evil with which it is sent. She says further, whenever the sky was covered, his face would change. He would enter and go out of his house. He would enter and go out. So come in and out, in and out, like a paranoid person. And he would pace up and down. If it rained, he would become happy. Aisha radiallahu anna asked him once about this, and he said, it could be what Aad have faced. Then when they saw it as a dense cloud, he recited the verse, and when they saw it as a dense cloud coming towards their valleys, they said, this is a cloud that shall give us rain. When it didn't, didn't give them rain, but a punishment, this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, Ya Rasul Allah, Allah will send a punishment, and we will all be destroyed. Anahliku wa fina salihun. Will Allah punish? A people and among them or among us there are those who are righteous as well so there could be believers among the righteous ones Allah will destroy them is that possible Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied إِذَا كَثُرَ الْفَسَادِ yes Aisha he would if corruption exceeds too much because the people in that land the Muslims and the believers have a duty they have a duty to change things if they can to warn to guide to not just to sit alone in their homes and say belief or religion is only inside my bedroom. Islam is the only religion that doesn't do that. If they cannot, then they should escape the corruption. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ never even himself knew. So he would be afraid when winds came and when it rained he would say Alhamdulillah. Aisha radiallahu anha is to ask, will we get destroyed even among us there are believers? He said yes, if corruption exceeds. There is a great wisdom in something like that. When people are unable to practice their deen, <coughs> Muslims unable to practice their deen in that land, they must migrate and go to a land where they can. The next prophet that came after them, brothers and sisters, was the name of Salih. The people that came after Ad went back to the worship of one God, because they were believers, but they died out and they had children and the shaitan came again. And he gave them ideas. And the desires began to play again. The temptations began to play again. And people went back, subhanAllah, to worshipping different types of idols. But this time, the type of idol that the people of Thamud were following weren't only statues. They did follow statues, subhanAllah. But they had an associate idol. And that was themselves. Themselves. They governed what happens and they governed what doesn't happen. They governed what's right and they governed what's wrong. And they made themselves gods. As for the belief of statues was just something symbolic, uh, a secret, a belief, individual belief, which they found their forefathers on. It had no, not much meaning, but just as, you know, something, an identity to hold on, onto. That's all. 
false or right, doesn't, they didn't really care. What they really cared about was their advanced technology as well. They had learned from Ad that they once had ancestors that were advanced in technology. There's nothing wrong with being advanced in technology. But you use the advancement in technologies for good, not for wrong. And you do not take pride in the sense that now you see yourself superior to everyone else. This is the wrong thing about it. And you don't let it overtake your worship and your purpose in life and make it your main aim and objective. There are people who work at night and day. It even gets in the way of their prayers and name, way of their family, way of their worship, way of the, the loved ones, just for the sake of money, building and building and buying and building until they die. And subhanAllah, none of them ever reach their goal. The richest of riches. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala despises. People who consume the world so... Uh, provocatively to assume the world subhanallah so you know obsessively is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us from becoming so the people of Thamud worshipped themselves a little bit more than worshipping their idols they were even more advanced in their technology than their former cousins Ad they built as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them in the Quran he said, And relate the story or the mention of Thamud, who used to bring the huge rocks and stones from beneath deep valleys. In another verse of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and you, O oh people of Thamud, is referring to, you carved into mountains homes and palaces. This is their advanced technology. They used to carve inside of mountains of rocks. This is a mountain a cliff. And they would carve with their tools rooms and corridors and buildings and stories and beautiful features inside of rocky mountains. And they allowed air and, and light to come in spontaneously and also in an orderly fashion. How did they do that? How did they bring huge stones the size of hills, the size of this mosque, from beneath valleys, depth of valleys? And how did they actually carve into mountains palaces that they lived in? Allowing light to penetrate and air to penetrate everything. This was their advanced technology. Till today, it is a wonder of the world. Till today. With our advanced technology today, we find it difficult to do something like that. Imagine their primitive time. And again, this got to their heads. Brothers and sisters, you can actually, Allah has left for us their artifacts, their buildings today. You can see them, they are in Jordan. And you can look them up on the internet and you will find them. You can still see their carved out palaces and castles and homes inside of cliffs and mountains. They are there. And people see them all the time. It's a tourist attraction. And Allah this time left them as a sign of their existence and what Allah had, did, had done to them mentioned in the Quran. When Salih came to them. Salih alayhi salam also was raised among them. Allah mentions him in the Quran saying, وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ صَالِحًا قَالَ يَا قَوْمِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مَا لَكُمْ مِنْ إِلَٰهٍ غَيْرُهُ قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ بَيِّنَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ قَدْ جَاءَتْكُمْ بَيِّنَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّكُمْ هَذِهِ نَاقَةُ اللَّهِ لَكُمْ آيَةٌ فَذَرُوهَا تَأْكُلْ فِي أَرْضِ اللَّهِ وَلَا تَمَسُّوهَا بِسُوءٍ وَلَا تَمَسُّوهَا بِسُوءٍ فَيَأْخُذَكُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ Allah says, And to Thamud we sent their brother Salih. He said, 
O my people, worship Allah. You have no God other than him. There has now come to you a clear sign from your Lord. This is Allah's she-camel, a sign for you. So leave her alone to graze on Allah's earth and do not harm her, lest a painful chastisement should seize you. The story goes like this. Salih alayhi salam was known to be wise and honest among them. When he came to them with the message of worshipping one God and stopping the worship of idols and stopping the worship of themselves, they turned to him. And the words that they ceased to say to him were, Ya Salih, Ya Salih, qad kunta fina marjuwa. This is also in the Quran. O oh Salih, you used to be a respected, honorable person among us. What happened to you? In other words, what happened to you? Why did you go crazy all of a sudden? You used to be an honorable and respectful person among us. This is the sleaze, this is the sneaky, manipulative way that the corruptors of morality and justice speak. The media is driven by them and they drive these thoughts through the media. They make you see an evil person as a hero and they can make a hero look as an evil person. They can make a totally intelligent person look as though they know nothing and primitive and a primitive person who was filled with stupidity and arrogance and a malady of the most worst of type to look like they are the most intelligent of the world. Allahu Akbar. They said to him, Qad kunta fina marjua. You were a respectful, honorable person among us. What happened to you? He said to them, Oh my people, if you think that what I am saying to you is too much, and if you think that what I am saying to you makes no sense, and if you don't believe what I have come to you with, then how can I force it upon you when you don't want it? Allah says, should we force it upon you when you don't want it? I'm not going to force it upon you. But I am only an advisor and a warner to you from God. So then they turned to him and said, Okay, Salih, then bring to us a sign. We want a miracle. You call yourself a prophet, we want a miracle. Now the reason why they asked him this question, brothers and sisters, is not to know the truth. They had already known the truth. They had already known who Salih is. His words made sense to them. But now they were being sarcastic. They were being silly. So what did the leaders come and say? Childishly, they said, we want a miracle from you, show us. So Salih turned back to them and said, okay, good. You want a miracle and a sign? I will give you a miracle and a sign from my Lord if he wills. I am but a messenger from God. So then, they said to him, then bring us one. Salih turned around and said to them, my Lord says, anything you choose, you choose it. You say what you want to see as a miracle and I will do it for you bi-idhnillah with the power of Allah. They said, we'll decide. They said, you decide. They said, anything. He said, you name it and it will happen. You choose. So they said, they gathered each other, the mala, as Allah subhanahu calls them, the mala, alladheena stakbaru, the leaders of them who were full of arrogance and proudiness and haughtiness. They said to him, one of them said, okay, we want you to produce to us a fully grown she-camel, a camel that's a female. It can't be born from any other camel. And it can't be a, a baby that's growing. It has to be right there and then a full grown she-camel. Pop up like that. They laughed. Then a second person said, oh, I have one too. This same she-camel that has to pop up from nowhere has to be the hugest she-camel we have ever laid eyes on in our life. A third person said, in fact, it has to, how about this one? It has to be so big that there is a well that we share, that we drink from in the city. It has to be so big that it would need to drink from this whole one well so that no more water is left in the well for the whole city to drink in one day. Then a fourth person said, I have a good one. This same she camel has to come out from that rock over there. There was like a hill, a rock. It has to come out from the rock. <laughs> then a sixth person said, the she camel also has to come out pregnant 
with another camel. And it has to be a male just about to be given birth, just given birth to. They all laughed and they started to talk among each other. The media went out. Then Saleh came back to them and said, In fa'altu atu'minun. If I did this, will you then believe? They looked at each other and said, of course we will, sarcastically. They went back home calling him a crazy man, a lunatic, a silly man. A few weeks, months went by. And this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works with the people who go against him. He lets them for a little while until they all talk among each other and they say the, the, you know, words that they will regret later on. So he let them go for a little while. Nothing happened. Then the day came, my dear brothers and sisters, as Prophet ﷺ describes it to us. And one day, Saleh had made an appointment for them and said to them, come and meet me near the rock that you chose, the big stone or the big cliff. They met him there. And bi'idhnillah, with the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before their eyes, the earth rumbled and the big stone or the big hill cracked open. And out of it walked the largest she camel they have ever seen and was pregnant with another camel which was almost about to give birth before their eyes obviously not the whole town was there there were the leaders and the main people when they saw this before their eyes the messenger alayhi salam salih said to them hadhihi naqatullahi lakum Ayah. This is the she camel of Allah. It doesn't belong to anyone. It's not born from any other camel. It's Allah's camel. This is the she camel of Allah for you as an ayah, as a miracle, as a sign, as you have asked. Fadaruha. You have to now leave it. God has made a condition. You're not allowed to harm it, you're not allowed to touch it, and you have to leave it to graze wherever it wants. Also, since you asked for it to drink from your well, as you requested, you have to leave the well for one whole day. No one's allowed to touch the well. The she camel has to drink. And so the she camel drank for one whole day and it finished all the water. The next day, as the fountain or as the, uh, the water built up, it said, and the next day the village gets to drink. So one day she camel, one day the rest of the city. It gave birth to its new camel. And now the baby camel also needed to drink with it. So they would finish the whole well, and the next day the whole city would have to come and drink from the well. Only a small amount of people believed. And the amount of people that believed were the ones considered inferior. Allah says in the Quran, قَالَ الْمَلَأُ الَّذِينَ اسْتَكْبَرُوا مِنْ قَوْمِهِ لِلَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا لِمَنْ آمَنَ مِنْهُمْ لمن آمن منهم أتعلمون أن صالحا مرسل من ربه قالوا إنا بما أرسل به مؤمنون قال الذين استكبروا إنا بالذي آمنتم به كافرون فَعَقَرُوا النَّاقَةَ فَعَوَعَتَوْا عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِمْ فَعَقَرُوا النَّاقَةَ وَعَتَوْا عَنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّهِمْ وَقَالُوا يَا صَالِحُ أَتِنَا بِمَا تَعِدُنَا إِتِنَا بِمَا تَعِدُنَا إِنْ كُنْتَ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ الله أكبر The chiefs, Allah says, the chiefs of those who behaved arrogantly among his people said, to those who were considered weak from those who believed, do you know that Salih, do you believe that Salih is sent by the Lord? They said, indeed, we believe in the messenger with which he has been sent, or the message which, with, with which he has been sent. Those who were haughty said, we certainly disbelieve in what you believe. So they slew or they slay the she-camel, and insolently defied their Lord's command and challenged Saleh saying, bring us that which you threaten us with if you are a messenger. They killed it. They slaughtered it. And they ate it and they killed its baby. 
And they said to the ones inferior to them, as they considered, we are disbelievers in what he has come to, you stupid people. This is magic, this is sorcery. They went and killed it and they said to Salih, bring us to what you have been... Exactly like the oppressors of the world today, it says that Arahat, a group of young men who were troublemakers, about eight of them, they got together in secret with the chiefs of the city. And they said in secret when Salih was away, they said, we're going to go in the night and we will kill the she-camel. Because this she-camel has caused us problems. What is this? Everyone's now believing in what Salih has come with. Kill it, get rid of it. We can't lose what we have of pride and power. Secondly, what's this? It drinks from the whole well. We have to wait till the next day. Kill it. And thirdly, this is a lot of meat. It can serve the whole city. So they went in the dark and these eight people, they killed the she-camel. They said they could hear its sound from the hills to the city. And then its baby began to cry and they also came to it and killed it. They cut it up and they ate it and Salih alayhi salam found out later on. And he said, you have killed the she-camel of Allah which was entrusted to you. It is, a, it is sanctioned by Allah and you killed it. Now be away to the punishment of your Lord. Allah says, the punishment surely came to them. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ كَذَّبَ أَصْحَابُ الْحِجْرِ الْمُرْسَلِينَ وَآتَيْنَاهُمْ آيَاتِنَا فَكَانُوا عَنْهَا مُعْرِضِينَ وَكَانُوا يَنْحِتُونَ مِنَ الْجِبَالِ بُيُوتًا آمِنِينَ فَأَخَذَتْهُمُ الصَّيْحَةُ مُصْبِحِينَ فَمَا أَغْنَى عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ And the people of Al-Hijr, this was their place, it was called Al-Hijr, disbelieved the messengers and we gave them our signs, but they turned away from them. They were hewing houses, meaning they were building lofty houses from the mountains, dwelling therein deemed security, meaning they thought that if they go into their mountains, they're secured behind fortresses. So the thunderous cry seized them in the morning and what they achieved proved no avail for them. As-Sayha, Allah had sent Jibreel alayhi salam and he screamed. As-Sayha. And, and they all died from it. Their brains busted, their ears exploded and they died. And the first that died were the eight who killed the she-camel. <sighs> Salih said again to them, you do not heed the warners.